the thing I love to talk about most in the world is aliveness. Again, because aliveness to me is a tangible thing that I can use as a compass. There is or is not more life in everything that we do and everything that we eat and all of our soil and all of the dirt. <laughs> the good dirt is the dirt that is increasingly closer and more connected to us and more nourished so that we are more nourished. And that's a never ending cycle as far as I can tell. You're listening to the Good Dirt Podcast. This is a place where we dig into the nitty gritty of sustainable living through food, fashion, and lifestyle. And we're your hosts, Mary and Emma Kingsley, the mother and daughter founder team of Lady Farmer. We're sowing seeds of slow living through our community platform, events, and online marketplace. We started this podcast as a means to share the wealth of information and quality conversations that we're having in our world as we dream up and deliver ways for each of us to live into the new paradigm, one that is regenerative, balanced, and whole. We want to put the microphone in front of the voices that need to be heard the most right now. The farmers, the dreamers, the designers, and the doers. So come cultivate a better world with us. We're so glad you're here. Now, let's dig in. So, we're getting so close to Thanksgiving and Slow Friday as we like to call it here in Lady Farmerland. Yeah. And if you hear my dog in the background chewing on her bone, that's just what it's going to be today. <laughs> because that's where we are. My dog likes to chew on her bone. So apologize if you can hear that in the back. If not, it's all good. We are here to talk about Thanksgiving, to talk about moving slowly into the holidays, to bring you another great interview and we're just really excited that you're here. Thank you for listening to The Good Dirt. I hope you all have had a wonderful fall. And getting in the spirit of the holiday, Thanksgiving, which is, you know, one of my favorite holidays, I must say, because it has all of the joy and fun and family stuff as Christmas, but somehow just without all the stress. And maybe this is coming from a position of, you know, I've never fully hosted or cooked. I've always just been a guest <laughs> at a Thanksgiving or, you know, growing up as a child in a big extended family. And it's just always been so fun. Anyways, that's how I feel about Thanksgiving. I love it. And I have some really fun memories of it being a holiday where we could just also do it with our friends too, like our neighborhood friends. And I remember there was one Thanksgiving where I think y'all broke down, your car broke down on the side of the road. And Someone came to help you and then you were talking yeah. to them and they didn't have anywhere to go for Thanksgiving and you invited them to our house. <laughs> I was actually going to tell that story. Amazing. I just set you up. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking about Thanksgiving and what's a Thanksgiving memory and all that. And it's funny that this story came up. This is when we were living in Georgia and my sister-in-law, Laura, and I were out running some errand on Thanksgiving morning and we had a flat tire and this couple stopped to help us and make sure we were okay. And they were, they were so nice. And you know, we were chatting with them and we said, well, what are y'all doing today? And they said, we don't know. We haven't decided. And yeah, this was Thanksgiving day, right? Mm -hmm. And we had this big meal going at home and, you know, all these people and it's already kind of chaotic and <laughs> wonderful and tons of food, too much food and all that kind of thing. So we said, well, you know, come on, we just live up the road. Come on over and have Thanksgiving dinner with us. And they hesitated a moment. But not too long. And in a moment, they said, okay, we'll come. And they did. They came. And I remember it. They were just, they were fun and delightful. They fit right in. You would have thought we had known them forever. And we just had a, a fun time with them. And then afterwards, they said, thank you very much. And they left. And that's the last we've... I know. You know, I, it's so funny. That's like... Yeah. Like before cell phones, before texting, and like I don't even remember their names. We definitely didn't keep in touch with them. No. It was like we didn't have to. <laughs> it's just like come over for dinner. Yeah. And then they left. <laughs> yes. I don't think we ever had any contact with them ever again. Isn't that? Yeah. It's just this funny little isolated memory, holiday memory. Mm -hmm. Let's make a movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I bet we could. That'd be really funny. It would have to have some drama. Right. So we hope that y'all, wherever you are and whoever you're with or 
not with. (laughs) We hope that you find some joy amidst the chaos and have a good Thanksgiving if you celebrate or a good fall meal wherever you are. And yeah, enjoy. enjoy. Slow living through the season. Exactly. Yes. So as also we do like to note on the Good Dirt podcast, Net Lady Farm a lot, you know, what comes right after Thanksgiving is we call it Slow Friday. But in the rest of the world, it's Black Friday and Small Business Saturday and Cyber Monday and Giving to it's just the barrage of marketing and buying and Christmas shopping begins off to the races. And it's a really intense time. And so we just got to speed everyone. We're going to replay our slow holiday episode for you. So hopefully it's not too far down in the feed or it'll be coming up the next couple of days so you can listen to that and think about alternatives. Truly, it's just an alternative mindset to all of it. So on that note, we do have an amazing sale still going in our marketplace. (laughs) Life is full of paradoxes. (laughs) You know, it's ending before the crazy weekend. So the idea was we're going to beat the crazy. No, just kidding. Honestly, you guys, we are selling through a lot of our sustainable apparel, which is what we started this company on in the first place. And we are making space in our marketplace for other beautiful things. And we are letting the sustainable apparel companies and the people working in that space, do what they do best. And we're not going to be making clothes anymore. So it's kind of the end of an era for us at Lady Farmer. And if you want a piece of it, now is your chance. We love you all. Thank you so much for your support. And while I hope that you were able to recuse yourself from the holiday shopping madness, another mindset that I like to offer as an alternative is the joy of supporting smaller businesses and artists and people that you want to support. So that's always fun too. Yes. I think when we frame it as, you know, our money is a obviously a resource. It's also a form of energy. It's a form of support. And beyond just simply purchasing things, we get to make decisions about where we want to offer our resources and energy and support and all that. So it becomes something of intention and not just, what's the word, automatic behaviors. So yeah, or like rote is what came to my head. Like, robotic, just do it because it's what you do. Yeah. As we're always encouraging ourselves and others to do, act with thought and intention and knowledge, all those things as you go forth into a season when everyone wants your money. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, let's talk about some stuff. It's a fun one. This was a very, con- like, really meaty conversation for the sake of talking and making connections and listening. And it was really cool. Yeah. And actually our guest, Brandy Stanley, she makes a living out of making connections. She has a podcast called This Plus That, which makes connections between all kinds of things. She brings people in to talk about science and art, fermenting and theology, permaculture and social movements, neuroscience and dance, just to name a few of her episodes. She says, if creativity is the ability to connect the seemingly unconnectable, that's her art. She's in love with the space between things, the intersections and the paradoxes. She's constantly looking for what insights can be gained when we mash the unexpected together with the growth that happens when we learn to hold complexity. So as you mentioned, she does have her own podcast called This Plus That. She's interviewed guests like authors David Epstein and Charles Eisenstein, well-known artists like Ashley Liza Williams and Tyler Thrasher. And when she's not working on the podcast, she is probably obsessing over great food and fermenting everything in sight. Yeah, <laughs> we get that. We had such a great time talking to Brandy about so many things from the hustle culture to church history, from empty calories as a metaphor to the gift economy, and of course, all of the good dirt in between all of it. So if you enjoy connecting the dots, as they say, and discovering how much more we all have in common with each other than we think, then you'll love this conversation. So here's Brandy Stanley of This Plus That. Enjoy.
My name is Brandy Stanley. I think if we're talking in terms of like what I do in the world to start out with, I spent most of my career in some form of branding and marketing. So I've done a lot of communications work in my life, which did include a lot of writing and creating content. <laughs> I spent probably a good decade feeling like, you know, I think it's the sort of typical artist story. It's like you feel something that's just like gnawing at you, like inside, it's like a whisper you can't get rid of. That was this sort of feeling like if I had died tomorrow, that I would not have fulfilled what I was here to do if I continued to do that forever. But capitalism and the economy and making money, it was what was easy for me to do. And so I continued to do it for a long time. And I sort of went in and out of full-time work to contract work, running my own business. But as the story goes, in 2020, I left my last full-time job as a brand director of three years, a company I worked for in Denver. And January 31st was my last day. And so February wow. 1st of 2020, I started my own business. And it was a branding and marketing coaching business online for people. I had this internal feeling that... I think number one, like I don't really see anything that we do in our lives as a waste. It's like compost, right? Like you get to take what you've done and integrate it into what you do and it makes the soil richer, I guess. And so I thought maybe there was a way I could take what I had learned and all of that, create a business to help other people out that would be a win for them, use the skills that I had developed over nearly 20 years of doing that work. Uh, which would be a win for me because it would mean I wouldn't have to completely cut off something that I had done and still help people out. But I think this is so reflective of the way that we think of nature too. Like I was I was trying to figure out essentially how little I could work doing what I didn't want to do so I could buy back the time doing what I did want to do. Mm -hmm. I spent about a year in 2020, thankfully bolstered by weirdly the <laughs> unemployment through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So that gave me a lot of opportunity, I think, like a lot of people to explore and build and create something that I hadn't done before. And so I tried to build a business doing that. And a lot of the time I spent trying to basically in a spreadsheet, figure out how I could create products with as little time and effort on my end as possible and still help as many people out. But then make enough money so that I could actually do what I cared to do in the world. My friend Kyle often says, give an entrepreneur a spreadsheet and they'll be a millionaire in 30 minutes, basically. Yeah. So, you know, I just I basically oh, yeah. was doing it in the fake world <laughs> online, trying to figure out how I could sort of rig together a business that would be super profitable, take very little time and help a lot of people out. And as it turns out, anytime you do something that you don't really want to do, it doesn't really matter how much time you give or don't give to it. It sort of suffocates you. And I think it's sort of ridiculous to think that you could run a business and not be thinking about it all the time. <laughs> I don't know anyone who hasn't done that. And it's not to say that there are people who haven't built businesses where they're not, they don't have a ton of time off. Yeah. But basically, I think I had this underlying belief system that didn't think that it was possible, truly, to make a living doing what you loved. And my friends kindly watched me just sort of spin myself out doing that for about a year until in January 2021, about a year later, I found myself, and I say this on my own podcast, I found myself basically sobbing in my bathtub, <laughs> having panic attacks, and had a very like Liz Gilbert moment, which was something to the effect of, I don't know what next is, but it's not this. I cannot do this anymore. And I think that's not uncommon also in the pandemic that a lot of people was even listening to the Happiness Lab this morning and Lori was talking with her guest about calling it the great resignation, that so many people are leaving their jobs and trying to do something else or like doing things that feel like they have meaning and because so many of us don't feel like what we're doing actually has deep meaning to us. And so I didn't know what it was, but I knew that I couldn't do it. So I literally sent an email to all of my newsletter people and was like, this is done follow me somewhere else, but I'm never writing here again. <laughs> I shut the business down and I took some time off. Again, thankfully, the unemployment from the pandemic allowed me to do that, to have space. Like we just never in history really have space, really. And I know other people in the pandemic did not have that space. They had quite the opposite. But my experience was a lot of alone time and an ability to take some time off. And so I just gave myself space. And I think the more personal stuff outside of career that interweaves with this story is that I have always been someone who's been interested in a lot of different things. 
I'm a very curious person. I think uh, Wendell Berry in the farming world is pretty well known for talking about the idea of generalists versus specialists. I think I've always been a generalist at heart. I'm curious about everything. And so I get really bored pretty easily spending too much time in one thing. And it really lights me up to think about what other things I could learn. And also a lot of frustration that in the working world that you often have to narrow yourself down to a, a very particular thing and just choose a single thing in order to often make a living. And so one of the like aha moments for me was I say this bit of the story in an interview I had with David Epstein where I talk about how I once probably in the middle of my last full-time branding job that I mentioned, I had this moment where I was like on my living room floor and I had spread out like a huge piece of paper and I on it just wrote all of these things that I was really interested in, like huge circles. So there was like art and writing and science and ecology and all this stuff. And I was trying to basically map like, Brandy, what is it that's truly what you're here to do? And I had it just like posted in my living room for a long time, like on an easel so I could see it every time I was in my living room. And I don't know what happened, but I remember coming home some night and seeing it and having this instant revelation when I saw it, that my gift is not any of those one particular things. It's weaving connections between all of them. That's where I get really lit up. So when I took that break, I was out on a walk and I had this moment where I was like, so the description of my podcast, which is called This Plus That, is connecting the seemingly unconnectable and why it matters. And I don't know if I had just recently heard a quote from Steve Jobs from someone that's basically the description of creativity is connecting the seemingly unconnectable. But for whatever reason, I was out on this walk and I was like, what if I just interviewed people who were individuals who were connecting wild things in the world and finding insights at the middle of those things? Because that's fascinating to me. And it's also endlessly generative. I will never run out of topics to cover, basically. And I had heard of things before that were like one person who did one thing and another person who did something else and people who were like mashing that together and trying to find out like what the connections were between these two disparate people working in the world. But I've always been fascinated by people who like had heard this story about a guy named Nathan Mirvold, who I think he used to work for or still works for Microsoft, pretty high in the ranks there and used to work like do some stuff around weather and knew something about hurricanes and realized later when he got into bread that hurricanes were connected to yeast in some way. And I was like, that's what I'm talking about. I get so <laughs> excited hearing those things. So long story not short, I decided to create a podcast and eventually came up with a title and this plus that and started interviewing some folks and I relaunched my newsletter and have been creating content sense with that same, I guess, intersectional thinking and how we can bring seemingly disparate things together. And yeah, here I am. That's remarkable because if there's anything that describes the world we live in, I think it's disparate thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, for yep. sure. Coming at us all the time and living within the conflicts and the conundrums and the questions. And Yep. This one you're talking about this time about this, what do I do with my life? Emma just shared on some recording we were doing in the last couple of days, the Mary Oliver poem that's so often quoted where she ends up saying, what is it you will do with your one wild and precious life? Yes. And everybody thinks, everybody hears that, like, what are you going to accomplish? Yeah. Like what your yeah. dreams, which is part of it, obviously. But And Emma yeah. shared this poem, the 100th episode, mm. I think, um, wow. where it's not really about that. It's more about learning how to just be. Yeah, because if mm -hmm. you read the whole rest of the poem, she's like, I'm lying in grass. I'm talking to this grasshopper. What are you doing? Yeah. And I had never thought of it like that before. Maybe that's why I sort of follow in a long lineage of incredible writers like Ursula K. Le Guin and Mary Oliver, who when you hear about their writing routine, it's like, I wrote for three hours in the morning and then I spent the rest of the day relaxing, hanging out with my family in nature, doing other yeah. things. So there's th this tension in our culture. You have to do this thing to generate income so you can live. But it's so often, it seems so much in conflict with our inner selves. Yeah. And I think too, I mean, 
in my experience, even when you start doing something that you love, my challenge has been not making it into a productivity game, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. that I'm not overworking myself even doing something that I enjoy. So it, it became not only about what I was doing, but how I was doing it actually became more important. And I think that's actually sort of the mystic path. Like when you hear ancient mystics of any kind talk about meaning, whether it's from Buddhism or Christianity or Hinduism that or Islam that generally the entire thing is we'll be here now. Mm-hmm. So the only thing that really matters is yeah, it's, it's a way of being, I guess, in the world. Have you ever read Ishmael by Daniel Quinn? I have not. I bring that up so often since I read <laughs> it's it. Like, this is like every interview for the past. <gasps> well, not every. It's okay. I do that with the movie Arrival. I mention it almost oh, everywhere yeah. I go, and it gets a little. I forgot about people, the movie. Yeah, but it really. I want to rewatch it now. He raises these questions of like, humans have created this whole paradigm where we, and this is actually, this comes out in one of the sequels, but we have to do all these things because the food is locked up. If, if you can sort of reduce that and understand that feeling. The food is not, we can't just walk out in the yard and eat anymore. Well, some of us can. I do that sometimes. But <laughs> as a society, you know, the food's not just out there available. The food is locked up behind a paywall. And mm-hmm. so we have this entire society, civilization, we call it, trying to figure out how to get their food. It's just mm-hmm. fascinating concept. When and where did we veer off into that? Yeah, I think there are some pretty specific examples to describe how that yeah. happens. <laughs> one of the people I follow is Charles Eisenstein, who talks a lot about the gift economy. And I think that's how we bring the paywall down, is that nature operates in the gift. Mm-hmm. And to be again, realigned more with nature. I think humans, I can't give you all of the economic details about why this is necessary or how it's possible, but I think that as individuals, like at least for me, I'm trying to practice what it means to live in the gift and not put my stuff behind a paywall as much as possible Mm -hmm. and allow people to give me gifts in return and believe that the universe, nature, whatever you want to call it, will provide to me when I need providing in the way that I need providing for. And yeah, as I think the global economy continues to sort of crumble that, like Charles says, the best thing that you can actually invest in is community. Because when things go awry, as a lot of people of color and folks experiencing poverty teach us, community actually keeps you alive. Mm-hmm. And community often, because you don't have the same resources that folks who have greater access and privilege do, you're often living in the gift. You go, I sow and mm-hmm. someone else grows food. Mm-hmm. And how do we keep each other well? Yeah. Historically, humans, that's how they survived until we, I guess, came out of the woods and started growing food. <laughs> yeah, I love Charles Eisenstein's stuff. I have listened to him on YouTube and very, very resonant with it. That's so cool. And that story, I'm sure so many will resonate with it. That's such a huge thing to do to take that gamble almost it feels like but to your yeah. point when you look at it is it really a gamble or is the other thing we were doing was that the gamble yeah and I think I've started to apply that framework both to my health and also to work like is it more of a gamble to stay safe and make somebody doing what you don't mm-hmm. really love and to like not live a life that you actually enjoy mm-hmm. or is it more of a gamble to risk doing something that you love how many of our guests have walked this journey of discerning and making decisions about just that, what you just described. What do I do? What do I do with my one wild and precious life? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also just want to take the opportunity to say, probably because I'm feeling personally triggered by this lately, but I do think that there was a lot of, or there has been, and there still is a lot of vilifying the nine to five corporate. And so you need to leave that and you can make a lot of money, kind of like passive income. It's so easy. Be a millionaire. There's that too. But then I feel like we become prey to this thinking that glorifies Mm -hmm. this hustle thing. All this to say that this theme of do what you love, even mm-hmm. within that, there's a lot of parsing through. Yeah, what you said about give an entrepreneur a spreadsheet, yeah, they're a, million, a, spreadsheet. a millionaire in five minutes. That's so true because yeah. you go, I could, I can make this I much just have to sell money. this many, this many. But what does it take to do that? It's like leaving one sort of extractive economy. Exactly. Really, honestly. It's like it's not actually examining the root of the problem, which is that we have been taught a way of operating that is meant to be extractive, not only of other people, but of ourselves also. I run a podcast that's about nuance and complexity, Mm -hmm. so I can give a lot more nuance there. But like at the end of the day, the easy thing for me to say would be just like passive income means how do I give as little of myself and extract as much as possible Mm -hmm. 
out of people and, every, you know, anything else that can give me profit. Mm-hmm. And it's still a type of separation. It is me being separated from the people that I'm serving in a lot of circumstances with passive income, not all of them, and being separated still from something that I love because there's something else that's running here that I don't have to pay attention to, but I have no actual real connection Mm -hmm. in it or investment into it in a lot of ways. Yeah. Again, I'm not going to say that all passive income or ways to like make as much as possible and work as little as possible are extractive, but that description sort of sounds like the dictionary definition of extraction. It's exploitative, Uh, And it's, you know, hustle culture is like exploitative of ourselves. How are we not giving ourselves enough time and rest and space? How many times are you posting on Instagram? Schedule ahead. Make sure that you can sit back because you know your Instagrams are scheduled. Yeah, again, it's like none of these things are necessarily bad in and of themselves. I think what I like to talk about is just the idea of aliveness. That's what sort of changed my life. And for me, aliveness was something that was different than joy and that joy, again, not to badmouth joy, obviously, (laughs) but joy felt a little like happiness or something to me. Like it was really hard to sort of understand what joy was, but aliveness was something I could actually feel energetically in my body. Am I more or less alive when I do this Mm -hmm. thing? Am I more or less alive when I am with these people? Am I more or less alive when I eat this particular food? And I think that relates to farming and soil too. Mm -hmm. Like is the, is the soil more or less alive? And, you know, I think we've separation and aliveness have something to do with each other. Mm -hmm. I think when you are in deep intimacy, like really deep intimacy with your relationships and with your food and with the land that you live on and with your work. I think when I reached out to you, I was sort of pitching the idea of empty calories. Mm -hmm. We spend so much of our lives eating and consuming and watching and spending our time on empty calories. So we're doing a lot of busy things, but we're actually not very full. Mm -hmm. And I like to quote, there's a line from Braiding Sweetgrass from Robin Wall Kimmerer, where she says, like, it basically, it leaves the belly full while the spirit is empty. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think I reversed that, but you get the gist. (laughs) And so, yeah, it's just like a different kind of engagement when you are, you know, again, it's like going back to Charles. It's like community isn't just some like woo or wishy-washy notion of like pleasantries or something. It's, it is really doing the work of questioning all the ways in your life in which you are separate from yourself. Like if you're denying yourself what you want to be doing in the world, or if you're not slowing down enough to pay attention to how your body is exhausted or things that drain your energy rather than fill you up. If you're separated from real relationship and even social media can be a place of real aliveness and joy, but Yeah, I tell people because I came from a marketing and branding background that, of course, how you do one thing is how you do everything else. And so the way that we do social media tends to be something that's like, oh, we think we have to keep producing and keep putting stuff out. And I think this goes back to the gift economy, that when you produce stuff in any way that you actually care about, that there's a deep connection to you. So even when you're writing social media or writing a newsletter or producing a podcast, you could do it probably twice a year. And if you had such an aliveness that comes from doing that work and it flows out of you like a gift, you are excited to do it. It brings you alive. It feels like you're offering it as a gift to other people. When you're actually operating in connection with yourself and not forcing yourself to say something in whatever way that you say things in the world, and it just comes up out of you because you're so enlivened by it. It's like you can't help but share. And that's a very different way to offer work to the world. And it's felt very differently by the people who hear it Mm -hmm. or read it. And when that feltness happens, they share it more. They talk about it more. They do all these things that are like better than if you had just forced content out that you don't actually care to be talking about at the moment or you're too tired to put out this morning or whatever it might be. And that is living in the gift, like nature. When you really start to live in alignment with your energy and with the universe and whatever makes you come alive and being in deep intimacy with those things, things come to you, synchronicities happen, magic occurs, and you are nourished in a way that you would have never been nourished the other way and other people around you are nourished. And 
it creates a generative economy. It's not saying you have to pay this much and you have to pay this often and you have to produce this much in order for me to pay you exactly that much. It no longer is transactional. It's transformational. And that's extremely different way to act in the world. A hundred percent. I also just love the idea of flipping the notion on its head that we, again, back to what you were saying, like early, early on, how can I do as little to make as much money as possible? In a way, how can we do more of what we what makes us come alive, as you're saying, and the money kind of either would equal that or, I don't know, be irrelevant? Yeah. Or someone gives you a ride or someone pays for a dinner, mm -hmm. you know, like it doesn't actually have to come in the form that you think it's going. You want it to come mm -hmm. in like being paid can yeah. look a lot of different and ways. And it makes me think of passive income. It's like, do we want to be passive? Is that how we want to live our life? Because what's passive exactly. then, you know, then what are we missing? It's separation. Yeah, it's a separation. It's not intimacy. For sure. Yeah. This is very helpful. I love this. Thank you, Randy. <laughs> Really You're so welcome. I want to shift a little bit, talk about, get into the meat of your POV, let's say. Because <laughs> yeah. you like to talk about connecting this seemingly unconnectable. Yes. Yeah. So I wanted to play with that a little bit because I love that concept. I'm so excited for this. So many themes come into this and so many themes. We talk about a lot of different themes and so do you. So let's just try this. So I just thought of some things and I thought we would just play with it. So let's, let's, do, let's it. do it. So how about the seemingly unconnectable topics such as how about soil and social justice? Yeah. So I don't think there is a single lens that you can look at soil with it not being connected to social justice. So I have so much to say about this. Go for it. Particularly, a lot of my background was in community organizing and social justice. So this is also something that's deeply important to me. But yeah, I think I'm going to go on a tear. Can I go on a go tear? For it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. And I think I'm sure a lot of things will come up in this. But so if the soil is lacking in nutrients, one aspect of what that affects in social justice is health. So health justice, if the soil doesn't have enough nutrients, you have to either eat so much food, it would be ridiculous, or you have to buy enough supplements to make up for the minerals and nutrients that you're lacking in your food. That, of course, is prohibitively expensive because supplements are not really a regulated industry. So that's extremely difficult for anyone who doesn't have enough money or enough time. It's also effective of reproductive justice. So the more the land is lacking in fertility, the more we are lacking in fertility, which means that more and more people are having to actually access and pay for things like IVF in order to birth children. And of course, IVF is extremely expensive. It also takes an awful lot of time. So there are only a very few people in the world can actually afford that. So I think then the flip of that question, like the way that we treat land is also tantamount to how we treat each other. So soil depletion has a lot to do with workers' rights. We overwork the land the same way that we overwork ourselves, like we were talking about, and our employees depleting all of us of energy. And only certain workers get access to time off, paid leave, parental leave, health care, and all of those things. So it's affecting mostly and most heavily on certain people. And then I think diversity is a big part of this too. The way that industrial food works, which relies so heavily on things like monocrops, monocrops are more susceptible to things like pesticides and disease. And that often requires a lot of external inputs in order to keep those monocrops alive. So yeah, pesticides to keep things thriving quote unquote, I don't know if monocrops really are a thriving crop, but, uh -huh. and then that's not really any different than us running companies or living lives that are lacking diversity. Like it requires us a lot of external inputs in order to make up for what we're lacking in the biodiversity of our own relationships. And then, yeah, of course, I mean, it's hard to talk about the connection of soil and social justice without mentioning colonialism and all those things around social justice actually have a lot to do with how our land has become and the soil has become depleted as well. For people that might be listening to this for the first time or new to these ideas about the yeah. soil depletion, 
Talk about that a little bit. I don't think that's a concept mm-hmm. that a lot of people fully get. The, the industrial food system and how it has impacted the actual nutrients in our food. Yeah, I will say I'm either the best or worst or both person to describe this because I'm not an actual farmer. I have done quite a bit of gardening. I'm more of a writer and a content person, but I care a lot about food. And especially because of my chronic illness, I have had to look a lot into how food impacts my health and our health collectively. And so from my understanding, basically like the biodiversity lacking in our guts is currently also reflective of the biodiversity lacking in our soil. And I think I'm going to riff off the top of my head of what I know about this, which is a couple of things. One of them being ruminants. Animals play a role in trampling on the grass, on pooping into the grass and adding nutrients back into the soil, where if you only have vegetables on the same land over and over and over again, eventually it becomes dust because vegetables take nutrients out and you either have to have cattle or animals ruminants in order to add that diversity back in to make the soil, keep the soil rich, or you have to use external fertilizers in order to put those nutrients back into the land. So that's one thing. And then monocrops in general, if you're not creating diversity, then Only certain things are added to or taken from the soil. So industrial agriculture has done that to a lot of our land. Yeah. I was just listening to, there's a podcast called Groundwork by someone Mm -hmm. I know named Kate Cavanaugh, which is incredible. And she has an interview with someone, I think her name is Alicia Brown, but Alicia is a farmer in upstate New York and was talking about how the evidence of soil depletion, at least the symptomatic thing of what's happening, I think it's a brick scale where you can actually measure the nutrient density of any one given thing that comes out of the soil. So if you take a strawberry or a tomato or something out, you can actually measure how much nutritional value is in it. And she was saying that apparently these days, even oranges have zero vitamin C. Mm. So like you could eat as much as you want and never actually get the vitamins and minerals and nutrients that we used to be able to just decades ago, probably. You know, our grandparents or your grandparents, maybe even my, my parents' generation back when people had big backyard gardens and stuff. And now that's coming back. But bottom line, you know, people just really need to understand that you can go out there and eat. You can go buy the conventionally grown, all the greens you want, all the fresh fruit, supposedly fresh fruit, and think you're eating a fantastic diet that right. your body is not getting the nutrients that it needs. Yeah. And on top of that, not only is the food less nutrient dense these days, but if they're not cultured, soaked, sprouted, cooked, the fibrous material of what we're eating also isn't breaking down enough so that they're less bioavailable to our bodies. So even if we ate nutrient dense food, the way we're eating it often Mm -hmm. isn't actually allowing our bodies to access the amount of nutrients that we need. So compounding a problem of nutrient depletion in the soil with cultures now who are so removed from some of how our ancestors used to make food that we're also adding to that problem, making it harder for our bodies to actually access those nutrients, even out of what we're getting. You know, the fermentation and the culturing and the the sourdough and all this sort of thing that people are getting more interested in now. But that's why. That's the bottom line. It's not just because it's a fun, old-fashioned skill. It increases the biodiversity of the nutrients in your food Yep. so that we can enhance the nutrition of the food we're eating. And of course, as we stay on here all the time, all the time, the more local, the better. Know your grower, know your farmer, know what inputs they use. That's how you're going to take real agency in the actual nutrition you're getting from your food. Yeah. I also just want to raise while we're having this discussion how, again, back to social justice, how messed up it is that that's a privileged thing to be able to do and that that access to that information and that knowledge about that is still out of reach for so many and that I think so much of our work should be in equalizing that and spreading that information. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that's part of what both of us are doing with both of our different podcasts is getting that information out there. But also just to the person listening who might not have any other access to any other food besides the produce in their grocery store. Right. It's okay. Doing the best we can. And Yeah, you do what you can with what you have. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I think even, I mean, a couple of things that came up for me there is that one, I think, like I said, how you do things is sometimes as important as what you're doing. So in that sense, I realize that even in my healing journey, I have a tendency to sort of be hyper vigilant. So I'm like, what are all the best things to eat? What's the best water filter? What's the best 
sheets I can sleep on, all of those things. And so it became so overwhelming to a point where I, I felt like I was actually operating in a way that was like the same trauma loop mm-hmm. that had created my sickness in the first place, which is our collective feeling of hypervigilance, of constantly under threat instead of connection and intimacy and safety and all those things. And then, yeah, one of my more powerful newsletters was called A Sick Society Plus an Individual Burden. And a lot of that was just about that same concept of just recognizing, like, even as a white person in the middle of the pandemic with unemployment, so I was barely working, but also a full decade of, like, looking into this work, the amount of time and energy I've had to spend in learning how to cook my food, culture my food, ferment my food, find out what food is good for me. And diet is still just like a never ending conundrum. Mm -hmm. You know, like everyone says a different diet is the right one. So how do you decipher between discern between what's right for you? Because the right diet is different for everybody. Again, like water filters, every product I own has basically been looked into. And the amount of time that that has required, even as someone with a ton of privilege, is just like an obscene Mm -hmm. amount of effort that like no one actually has. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah. And when I refer to empty calories, like the way that we consume media, you know, that's not actually very like nourishing to us that we check out of our lives that we're sort of separate from our lives and doing that the way that we eat food, you have to eat a lot of food that has empty calories in order to feel satiated. And that sort of metaphor applies to a lot of things, but it is not to place blame on people who don't have actual access and opportunity to buy things that are nourishing to them. It is never to that end. I think often like if we're talking about self-care, like we have a tendency to talk about self-care as though it's an individual's responsibility to eat all the right food, to take baths so that you recover from the job that's overworking you. And it doesn't actually take a look at the institutions or the systems that we've created collectively, like a job that does overwork you or a food system that makes it impossible to access nutrient dense food to the degree that we actually need it. Part of what I say in that newsletter is like, there's not enough step counts I could count or standing desk. I could stand at or bubble baths I can take in order to cope with the amount of need and lack that exists in that way. Nonetheless, when we operate in that, we also then turn the blame on individuals Mm -hmm. for being like, well, it's not only blame, but also responsibility. Like it's your job to make sure that you exercise enough to make sure that you take enough bubble baths to recover, (laughs) to read enough things, to go on vacations. But accessing those things is not only extremely difficult and more difficult for people who can't access them generally, but you just could not do enough of that in order to make up for a society that is actually sick. It's so true. It's like, it's also your job not to use plastic straws, take your mason jar everywhere with your water and your tea. Mm-hmm. Like I do, mm-hmm. right? Because to ride your bike, to find the right bike, yeah, and, to... and it's just crazy. I mean, even and we talk about that so much. The responsibility, the, the individual's efforts. Here's a compostable takeout container. Now you get to figure out what to do with it. Right. Right. <laughs> There's no place in your community that will compost these. So. But we did our part because right. yeah. we stamped compostable on it. Yeah. yeah. I was telling a friend the other day that I've gotten really into the effect of sunlight on our health. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I've been following this woman, Carrie, online. That's incredible. She doesn't list her actual last name anywhere that I can find, but her name is Carrie. She talks about quantum health and the role of sunlight, basically, um, in our lives. And because of that, I've gotten really into the circadian rhythm thing because I started to really struggle with some insomnia. So I was really like digging in on my sleep. And I've started to like wake up with sunrise, go see sunrise, go on walks in nature, like while UVA and UVB are available before, like I would burn in the morning or whatever. And The other thing she talks about is grounding. So the role of gaining electrons in our body by touching the earth with our feet and our bodies and how little of that we do these days. And I was like, oh, I'm really into this. So on my morning walks, I'm going to take off my shoes in this beautiful field while I'm looking at sunrise. And I did that. And I put on my shoes when I was done, walked down the path a little bit further. And there was a sign that said, notice of pesticide. And I was like, I can't get away from it. It's like, I try to be so intentional in everything that I do. And despite my best efforts, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's great. That's such a good story. I feel that so. And I mean, we have so many of these stories. I know. (laughs) It's everywhere. So you mentioned somewhere, one of your newsletters or something, that you had this background of Christianity. Yes. I just thought, okay, let's talk about Christianity and the industrial food system. That's a good one. That's a good one, Mary. Let's do it. All right, go. I'll start with sort of a short personal story. So I grew up in Dallas, sort of swimming in cultural Christianity, but I was not in a family that was actively practicing religion. 
my childhood was one that, like a lot of ours, wasn't the easiest. It's not worth going into now. But by the time I hit high school, it was sort of like empty calories. Like I was existing, but it didn't feel like I was actually alive. And I met a group of people who attended a local youth group. And I made friends with them and I started going to church because of them. And so I got into Christianity and I got into it hard because, again, I sort of tell people it was like filling a hole I didn't realize existed when I found it. I keep quoting this on things, but I heard recently on the On Being podcast, Krista Tippett quoted an ancient Greek philosopher and poet, Salon, who said, it's not that myth isn't true. It's that like myth has something that's true that's happened over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And so it felt like that. It was like something that my soul knew was true about the universe, that something was more sacred. Everything was sacred, perhaps. And I finally found something that was giving language to that. So I got into it really hard. I ended up going to, as I told you, I think maybe before we started recording, I went to a faith-based undergrad school in Arkansas as um, for college. I was really in it. I was in the culture and it didn't take me long to become pretty dissociated from the culture. There were a lot of things when I got really into it that just didn't feel like it aligned with my experience. And part of that is a story of coming out when I was 27 and having to disentangle what I'd been taught about sexuality and gender and faith and how those two things could coexist in the world. So I had been out of church for a really long time, and it still to this day is pretty difficult for me to describe my own faith journey or what I believe about spirituality or God without it turning into a six-week conversation. <laughs> but I'd love to have it with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so fun. <laughs> Same. I, it's, I love talking about it more than anything, really. But it's also been a struggle, like, as I've started doing this podcast and my writing and putting things out publicly in the world to give voice to that complexity and to talk about what I believe. And so it's interesting because I think when you start doing your creative work in the world, like what feels like your most connected creative work, weird things happen. I don't know how to put it another way. It's like all of a sudden, yeah, the synchronicities, the weird stuff that in the past I would have described as God and still probably do in a lot of ways started happening in a real way. And it was almost like what I had learned when I was younger in Christianity became more true, mm -hmm. not the harmful parts, but like these beautiful things I had learned about even, I interviewed someone named Emily McElroy on the intersections of painting plus prayer. And one of her painting series was a reference to this line in the Bible about basically to totally paraphrase, why do you spend so much time worrying when I've taken care of every blade of grass and every bird in the air? They don't have to worry, like toil for their food or clothing. Why are you worrying so much? So stuff like that, that was like, as I was doing this work, and like I said, being either hyper vigilant about all of my health and trying to figure out how to heal as quickly as possible or overproducing and trying to put out my content like as much as possible, that it was like, why am I doing this? And all of a sudden, lines like that became more real to me. If the universe, not just the God of Christianity, but the energy that runs through all things, if that's actually real and there's some truth behind the idea that I don't actually have to worry about my needs being met, how would that change how I behaved in the world? I think part of doing this work of this plus that, I tell people, is an ability to learn to how to hold complexity and nuance in a world that is very, very separated, or at least a false sense of separation that we've created so that we think that political parties are all that different or religions are all that different or any of those things that seem very taboo, but are actually, if we dug into them, are not all that different, it turns out. And so the other part of it for me sort of became a container for me to heal the seemingly disparate pieces mm. in myself. But to sort of tie that personal story with your question around the connections between industrial food and Christianity, one of the splits that happened when um, the Roman Empire and the faith of the empire was that there was this literal intentional squashing of not only nature as not sacred, but matter as not sacred, meaning like basically the only thing that was sacred were very particular things, and they were defined by very particular people, usually white men within a faith at a very high position of power, and usually top down. And Celtic Christianity seemed to operate in a way that was like they had no ecclesiastical, like there was no head church that was telling everybody what to believe. It was very much like practiced by individuals and in nature and no sort of defining ultimate authority. 
and correct me if I'm wrong, but many times matriarchal, correct? Yeah. Yes. That's the yeah. other thing is that like not separation, not only of matter and the sacred, but also the feminine from our lives as well in a lot of ways. So that actually is like an early description of how a lot of the Western world actually can trace its disconnection from the feminine back to that separation between the Roman Empire and like the sort of faith of the Celts. Yeah, basically, when you start believing that matter isn't sacred, that life doesn't run through all things. It's only in humans, for instance. It means that humans then, as the only thing that's sacred, can extract from the land without remorse or consequence. Mm -hmm. You can just remove all of its resources as much as you want without feeling bad about it at all. And it also means that only certain people were sacred. So priests and folks that you had to access, like gatekeepers to faith, basically. So it meant basically that people and land could be controlled mm -hmm. and we could colonize and extract people and land and all the resources from it until they were completely depleted and then move on to something else. So those all have ties to how we think of industrial agriculture today, right? Like that monocrops like we were talking about, or I mean, monocrops are a great example of passive income, basically, like the model where you go like, how can we create as much as possible that has as little nutrition as possible and sell it for as much as possible with as little of our time as possible which also requires things like tractors and other things that like chemical agents and mechanistic things that deplete the land and hurt the atmosphere and all kinds of other things, right? There's that. And then I think the other thing is like in part of that even disconnection from the feminine, there's less wild allowed in. If you can control everything, there's also only one right way to be a Christian. You have to do these certain sets of things in order to be the, a Christian that earns your way to salvation in heaven. And yeah, again, that's sort of like a monocrop as well. Mm. There's only one right way to grow food. There's only one right, like there's three monocrops or whatever. And if you don't look like that, then you're pushed out of the system. So again, check all the right boxes, you get saved. Like there's nothing wild about that. There's So everything becomes controllable and controlled. So again, I think it's fascinating to think about the way that we think about work today, even how we started this conversation that like, if I just do X, Y, and Z, if I can push myself this much, those all have traces back to not only our food and industrial agriculture, but like ancient decisions that were made by people of faith that impacted generations and global economies still today. It's so interesting. And you sort of enveloped the third connection piece that I was going to ask you. Was it at some point there was this break? Maybe it was with Genesis or maybe it was with the agricultural revolution or I don't know, maybe it was mm -hmm. a, a slowly evolving thing, but that, you know, humans were not a part of the rules of nature, mm -hmm. that they could act independently, extract, control, etc. Yeah. And so look where we are today. But this is the question that always boggles my mind, and we're not going to solve it tonight. But since you like to talk about things that are seemingly, seemingly, unconnected. Seemingly, <laughs> seemingly unconnected. So for thousands of years, we's, we've acted as if the rules of nature do not apply to the human race. In fact, the rules of nature mm -hmm. are in service to the human race. Right. But we are still inextricably part of the web of life. So that duality just exists all the time. What do you have to say about that? Well, I missed one thing. When you get out of tune with nature, so if we are relating it to Christianity, like if there was that break in the church that was away from the feminine, it was away from nature and those things, then you're more separated from the cycles of the moon and the sun. You're more separated from seasonal things that happen in nature, right? And so it's directly related to industrial agriculture because you're shipping things that go somewhere else that are out of season somewhere else, right? I can eat strawberries any time of year. I can eat a mango that doesn't grow anywhere near me and isn't in season either, right? So when we get out of tune with nature in that way, as industrial agriculture is, and as our I think our faith practices and stuff had been less and less in tune with nature also. And, and you know, the way that we're less in tune with the nature of our own bodies, like pushing myself to perform even when I'm tired or not looking at my work as seasonal and thinking I have to produce all the time, all year, every year, endlessly. Yeah, those are 
direct ties to the way that we think about faith and our trust in nature and gift economy and the universe and all those things that we've already talked about, right? So that's there too. It's a duality that we live with, but we constantly, we're constantly defining it. Even in the statements, we should be more connected to nature. Get out and get connected. You can't get more connected to nature. (laughs) You are so we sort of live it. We even live it in our in our language. Again, it's a I think it's a false duality yeah. that we've created, right? And how can we get to the point where that's not even in our language? How can we get to the point and are we so far beyond like ashes to ashes, dust to dust? I mean, that is us. We're not any different from the birds and the bushes. We're no different. We act like we are. We built a civilization like we are, but we're not. I am endlessly fascinated by the way that our language reflects the way that we think in Mm -hmm. the world or like impacts the way that we act. And yeah, it's true, of course, that we, again, how you do one thing is how you do everything. And that's true. And it's a little not true because it takes time to actually move your values out through everything that you do. There's that too. But regardless, the fact that we live in a constant false duality Mm -hmm. means that our language reflects it. It means that our work reflects it. It means that our food reflects it. It means that literally everything is reflective of that false duality, the way that we do the economy, everything. It's so true. (laughs) Everything. So one of the other things I love about Charles's work is that he talks about how we have created a story. We are living inside of a story, and that story is a false duality. We, as individuals, do, however, have the power to create a new story. And often that looks like what Adrienne Marie Brown often talks about is emergent So it's emergent strategy. So Mm -hmm. gathering with people around you, building direct, intimate relationships in which you are practicing a new story together, because to live into a new story by yourself is insanely difficult when you are in a culture that is living a different story. So it becomes extremely important to find people and things that help to feed you information and support and resources that are living into a new story. And so my hope is that more and more that we become people who are holding each other's hands into a new story that is breaking the false dichotomy, which I hope, like you said, that all of our content is actually serving a purpose for. And I think a lot of times content serves the first end, the first wave of that story in terms of awareness. So if we can simply speak to the thing in a way that a lot of people haven't heard, then hopefully that's one entryway that people begin to hold that new story together. And I've had folks write to me who live totally across the world and entirely different cultures who were like sending me DMs to be like, I've been told my whole life that I was too complex and that I couldn't like more than one thing. And I always had to choose one thing for work or whatever that I hated. And like any number of things that made me feel like I couldn't be my whole complete self. I can't believe I found you. I'm so grateful that someone is speaking to this. And that is just like not that's like I said, like that's a gift back to me. I don't have to be paid. That's like that will nourish me for a long time to come. And so even if we have to reach across, use media in a way that actually nourishes us to reach across distance to build a new story with other people that I think we are all slowly beginning to create an emergence and fractals that sort of fractal out to creating change in the world. Again, like Adrienne Marie Brown speaks about in terms of holding that and practicing that new story. So whether or not we do that, like you said, like if if there's hope for us doing it before the resources run out or before we die, I don't know. But sort of like I was talking about with my work, I think it's worth risking to give it a shot. Yeah. Doing that takes an extreme amount of swimming upstream because we are actively living in the other story. Every day we are living inside of capitalism. We're living inside of patriarchy, all those things. And those words, I don't use those words in order to turn people off. Like those are those are one story, but they're also a way that like we just create harm. And all I want to create is more connection and more intimacy and more realizing that we're actually more of the same and we are nature and all of those things. Yeah, it takes a lot of effort. And I think that's part of why it's important to live in community So that other people are helping you to hold that story together because as independent beings, it's very difficult to make all your own food, do all the grocery shopping, do all the gardening, do the farming at scale to make those changes. And so the gift economy does become an actual real practical reality where you go like, I can't actually do this alone. We have to live in relationship with other people. And as all of these structures that don't work around us crumble, the only thing that will keep us alive is each other. Wow. So, uh, so good, Brandy. So... What does the good dirt mean to you? Oh, the good dirt. 
I mean, given that we've been talking a lot about nutrient deficiency, I think the good dirt to me is nutrient density. So what is the kind of life and food and soil and conversation and media and all of those things that we can engage with that truly feed us, not false calories to keep applying that language, mm -hmm. but how are we truly nourished? And the more I am truly nourished, the more you're truly nourished, the more soil becomes more nourished. The thing I love to talk about most in the world is aliveness, again, because aliveness to me is a tangible thing that I can use as a compass. There is or is not more life in everything that we do and everything that we eat in all of our soil and all of the dirt. <laughs> the good dirt is the dirt that is increasingly closer and more connected to us and more nourished so that we are more nourished. And that's a never ending cycle as far as I can tell. Thank you. Oh, I love that. The, the more aliveness. And the good dirt is alive. That's so wonderful. Yeah. Good dirt is alive. Totally. In closing tonight, this wonderful conversation, what would you like to leave our audience with about what you do? Or is there anything else you want to add to the conversation and tell us where we can find you and where people can get more of Brandy Stanley? Maybe the last thing I would say is if you're in something in which it's not giving you a lot of liveness, sometimes endings create more life. And I think we see that a lot, not only in nature, yeah. but like in farming even. The seed has to die. Uh, yeah, you have to prune things. Animals die all the time. They feed and nourish us. So the death has to happen. And I think I battle often with whether or not it's worth doing this. Because like I said, it is really a lot of upstream work. It's a lot of upstream work for me as someone who battles chronic illness to wake up every day to do any sort of work, honestly, like just existing takes an awful lot of my energy in doing all the things that I have to do to keep my energy at a decent level. And often it feels tempting to be like, yeah, sometimes it feels like it'd just be easier just to not put all this energy into living the new story because it can feel exhausting. But in my experience, when I have removed more and more layers of separation, layers of separation from myself, layers of separation from my friendships and from my dating partners and from the land and from my food and all of that work, there is a fullness that Robin Wall Kimmerer talks about. There is just a nourishment that you feel deep in your bones that makes all of the work worth it. Where do people find you and follow you and listen to you and the podcast of course is called This Plus That. My website is thisplusthat.com. The podcast can be found everywhere and anywhere, basically, other than Pandora. I think it's like the one random place that I, I don't have the podcast on. Yeah, website is this plus that. That's where you, pe folks can also sign up for my newsletter. And I've been sort of on a hiatus. Like I said, I'm taking my own rest away from a bit of writing recently. And I've sort of backed off of releasing the podcast consistently, but it they would come out and they're coming out when I am rested and resourced and I feel in a generative place to share them. So they might be slower these days, but folks can find me and sign up for my newsletter and my writing there, which is much more personal in nature and shares my own reflections of interesting connections that I'm finding in my life beyond the podcast where I mostly interview people. Cool. And yeah, I'm on YouTube and then on regular social on Instagram and Twitter at this plus that pod. Yeah, it's been so timely and helpful for me yeah. even. So funny how that happens. I'm so glad I feel the same. Well, thank you so much. This has been an amazing conversation and we'll yeah, how lovely. stay in touch, but really enjoyed having you. Thank you so much. Same. What an honor. It's a gift to me. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in, calling in, and spreading the good dirt. We love hearing from you. You can reach our listener voicemail at 443-459-1950. That's 443-459-1950. You can find this number in our show notes and in our Instagram profile. This show is produced by Lady Farmer, a slow living lifestyle community. And the original music is composed and performed by John Kingsley. For more from Lady Farmer, follow us on Instagram at WeAreLadyFarmer. That's WeAreLadyFarmer. Or join us online at www.ladyfarmer.com. We'll see you next time on The Good Dirt. Goodbye.